Thank you very much. We've got a lot to cover, so we should probably uh, jump in. But, you know, I think when we're thinking about, uh, you know, news in a platform era, I was thinking about how if there was one word to, to sum up the analog era, it was scarcity. And then if there's one word to sum up the internet era, it's been abundance. And platforms have arisen to help consumers make sense of this. I think the first big platform we would think about is Google with search. And now we've got these other very powerful platforms emerging in social and in mobile. We've got Facebook and, and Twitter. Um, so we're going to talk about what it means to be a media property in this world of platforms. So uh, we're not actually in order here, but we've got uh, from uh, left to right, uh, Scott Lamb with BuzzFeed. And we've got David Arabov with Elite Daily and uh, David Spitz with Rebel Mouse. All very different perspectives. We've got two publishers and we have one platform provider. Um, so let me just start. Uh, Scott, BuzzFeed, you guys have been around since 2006, but really your exponential growth has probably been the last four years, right? Um, even maybe a little, a little less than that. I think most people know BuzzFeed kind of starting around the end of 2011, 2012, um, about the time we hired Ben Smith to come and be editor-in-chief at BuzzFeed. And that was when we, we really started focusing on creating our own content as opposed to, to curation. Um, but in that, kind of in that time period, that's a long time between 2006 and, and, and 2011, um, one thing that we did do was also build out our platform. So, you know, BuzzFeed, we think of ourselves mostly as a, as a media company, but we do have sort of the, the, the DNA of a technology company. We have a platform that anyone can sign up for and, and publish stuff on, um, even if people think of us m mostly as a, as a content creator. But I, I guess what I wonder is social has become a, an enormous driver, particularly Facebook. For yeah, definitely. Guys. So explain to me, how much uh, of your traffic ends up coming in through Facebook or other social channels versus direct to your site? Okay. Yeah, I mean, we, think of, we think of the social web as our, as our front page. So it's about 75% of our traffic comes through some social means, F Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, any of the other social networks. Okay, so that's, I mean, that's a huge yeah. amount. Yeah. And we'll get to the, the sort of risks there, but I think it's safe to say that enabled you to grow so fast. It definitely did, and I think, um, you know, it was, it was very key for us. It's key for a lot of publishers that are starting out now. Um, I know Eli from Upworthy was on stage earlier, and I think that this ecosystem is allowing people who are, have very young companies that, that do content in one form or another to grow very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Perfect like. segue. Scott, yeah. you did a great job with that segue. Amazing. Yeah. Um, David, Elite Daily, uh, you guys sort of describe yourselves as a, 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 what the publication for Generation Y, right? Yep, correct. So for the millennials. Yep. Um, in two years, you've gone from zero to what, 40 million uniques? Yeah, right now we're doing about 40 million uniques a month and 60 million total visits. And much of that is because of platforms, mm -hmm. would you say, right? Yeah. It, was that like sort of the strategy from the beginning or was that something you just sort of stumbled upon? I mean, um, the strategy from the beginning, you know, we were bootstrapped when we started, um, you know, never took on funding. So the strategy from the beginning was really to um, get our content out through social channels, because uh, what better way to market yourself than through social media? Um, we live in an age right now where people are spending a lot of time sitting on Facebook and Twitter all day long. Um, I believe people sit on Facebook for more than six hours a day. Um, so what better place to get them where they're sitting on a platform and really looking for content to engage with and read? Um, so we really honed in on those users and you know, told ourselves, let's go after the ones that are sitting in front of a computer all day on Facebook and show them the content that they want to see that we really believe wasn't really out there at the time when we started. Okay. So David, Rebel Mouse, a little bit different. You guys are not a publisher, you're a platform yourselves, but you're sort of rooted in, the, in this idea of social. Explain a little bit about Rebel Mouse. Yeah. I mean, to, to back up on the concept of, of platforms, I, I think there's, uh, we're, we're for the middle group of people who can't live on them and can't live off them. So there's some people, when I think of the New Yorker, my experience with them, doesn't, Facebook doesn't matter. I sit down for two hours on Sunday and that's, that's my experience outside of the platform world. Then there's people like my mom who probably shouldn't be publishing at all, but to the degree she's publishing, she's only publishing on Facebook. But then there's the middle ground of people like the companies represented here and the companies that we support with our platform who need content to circulate on and off 
They need to have their own branded presence, but they need to also be very active on Facebook, Twitter, the social channels. They need a unified view of analytics. They need a unified customer login. So that's the type of service that we provide for this new generation of media companies and the old generation of media companies for which uh, social is just an essential part of their DNA. So Scott, essential part of your DNA, um, and just to revisit uh, the Facebook uh, situation as a platform, we saw in a previous generation a lot of media companies that were built around Google as a platform. Companies like Demand Media, a lot of optimization went into showing up high in search results. Um, and that story sort of took a, a sort of bad turn when Google yeah. decided to cut them off. How big of a risk is Facebook doing the same to you? Um, I mean, it's certainly something we're concerned about. Uh, BuzzFeed gets uh, you know, a lot of our traffic from Facebook. If for some reason they were to turn off the hose, that would be certainly bad for us as a publisher. But I think the, the really key difference between what we're seeing now in the social world versus um, the, the bad old days of SEO is that it's not a, there aren't tricks to what it is that we do. We don't, we don't optimize by keywords or we're not trying to basically impress a machine. We're trying to impress people. Um, and if you are, you're making content really specifically for people to share, it's kind of, it, you know, at some point uh, there will be an, a new social network that none of us know about yet that someone's busily creating in their basement somewhere right now. Um, and as long as that network is about people sharing media with one another, I think that we're in a, in a pretty good position. Um, so the optimization that goes on with the content, I mean, I used to always do a test uh, in, the, in the sort of SEO era of Googling what time does the Super Bowl start, because the amount of publishers that actually published keyword stuffed articles on that, it was amazing. Now we have sort of, you know, listicles, if you will, like list articles, uh, 25 signs you went to fill in the blank for the university. Um, you guys have probably done 150 of those posts. Yeah, I think we've done every university in the United States at this point. <laughs> okay. But luckily there's the war, the world <laughs> We left. can expand. Um, tell me why this is like a good thing. I mean, because you're, you're optimizing very directly to sharing in, a, in, a, in, yes, those things get clicks and stuff like this, but does the world need like that next 25, 25 signs you went to X university? Um, I mean, it's difficult to answer the question of what the world needs exactly, but I think that when, when we think about that, we are, we're making content for people to express themselves. I mean, one of the ways that we think about what it is that we do at BuzzFeed, and there are a number of different things that we do, um, certainly content as a mode of expression is one of them. So one of the reasons that we have gone through and done every university in the United States is because it gives the opportunity for people who are sharing about this on Facebook, who went to that school or know someone who did, to start a conversation. Um, so people are seeing it. We're not, we're not optimizing just for them to read it or to click it. We, we want them to, to share it and to use it really as a mode of expression. David, how are, you, how are you guys using that kind of social sharing signals in order to determine what content to produce? Because it's very different from traditional media companies um, and with how they decide what their content strategy is going to be. I mean, with our content strategy, the beauty of what we do is uh, half of our content is curated, the other half of our content is created. Um, and because most of the people that work for the company are between the ages of 19 and 26, um, we have a pretty good feel of what type of content uh, the people in our age group would want to see because we're basically putting out the same thing that we would want to see. Um, so with us really deciding, it's really just based on the tastes that we would understand other people would like. Um, and just going back into the whole titles and optimizing, um, I think in the search era, you saw people optimizing for Google robots to pick up keywords, um, and that's why it was more so frowned upon. But now you're seeing, um, you know, w when we optimize titles, we're not optimizing for robots. We're not gaming a Facebook system. Uh, what we're optimizing for is people. Um, and, we're, uh, and when we do that, that's, that is when we get the best reaction and engagement from them. And what we're all really here competing for is real estate on Facebook and engagement on Facebook. Um, so, you know, the, the reason why we do optimize titles and, you know, many in the publishing world do so right now um, is because it works. It's what the people want. It's what the people are clicking on. Um, so you basically have to give them essentially what they want. Maybe. But, but I, mean, I mean, you guys have published How to Turn a Hoe into a Housewife. Um, I mean... Uh, is that what the people want? So two things about that. If you, saw, if you saw that article on Vice, you would actually think it's cool. So 
uh, to call us out on that yeah. would be quite wrong. Uh, the other thing is our content has, you know, we've, we have some edgy content. Um, we're a generation where that we're very outspoken and we talk about many different things. We're not, you know, the reserved re generation as many would know that. Um, another thing is we have 2,500 con contributors around the world. Uh, the beauty of our platform is that we're not one dimensional. We don't just see things with one point of view and only publish with one point of view. Uh, what we set out to do is build a community around content and deliver content that actually people our age group would want to read um, because the biggest thing we saw is that traditional media wasn't giving us the content we would want to read. So if one of our contributors wrote that article, then and obviously we have a line whether we publish it or not, um, but if one of our contributors decides to write that article, then you know we have a pretty good idea that hey, there's going to be other people in our age group that are going to want to read this because this is what our generation is all about. It's all about expressing new ideas, expressing new point of views. So that's really the thought process. So Scott, is is there a risk to over optimizing media for social? Um, because if if all you're looking for is shares, I wonder if you're going to end up building a lasting brand. Um, you know, I think that's something that we do we do worry about um, and and do think about. I think if you think about optimizing for social just in terms of writing headlines, um, it's certainly possible to over optimize that. I think that people, um, you know, there are a couple very well known styles of headline writing. Um, certainly, Buzzfeed's listicles are, are one of those. And I hear from people, mostly mostly journalists, but but elsewhere as well, that you know they they are kind of there's a feeling that they want to see something new. Um, so it's certainly incumbent on us to be constantly experimenting and expanding what it is that what sort of content we make, the way that the posts work. I don't think though that you can really, in a way, if if the if what you're going for as a publisher is to have people share your articles. I mean, that would be like over-optimizing for reading, um, which, you know, like, what does that even really mean exactly? Um, so I don't, I don't think there's a downside for thinking about the reader in that way in particular. Um, I think maybe some of the tactics, some of the, the, the techniques uh, can, can, get, can wear down people after a, a certain amount of time. Yeah. David? I, I was going to jump in. I came from more of a marketing background than a, than a publishing one. And it strikes me there's a, a parallel here to... You know, the, the divide that David Ogilvy saw 50 years ago between advertising and direct marketing. And back then he said, the difference is the chasm uh, between ignorance and knowledge. And it was a bit of an overstatement because he was trying to bring those two worlds together. But there is a difference here between data-driven uh, headline production, copy production, uh, article selection, um, and non. There's probably more that legacy media has to learn from these people than they have to learn from the others, but there's definitely something to be learned both ways. And if I, if I make it personal uh, one more time, my, my wife's grandmother sends me this clickbait uh, every week about she hates Obama, she hates Obamacare, and I got one the other day, uh, something about the, the letter from a Pearl Harbor veteran that Obama should read a trillion times. Those are the types of clickbait that she sends me. And after a while, I just don't open those things anymore. I send them to drafts or send them to delete. And that's what will happen to a, to a BuzzFeed or anyone else if it's just purely data driven. There has to be a brand or a heart behind it, or else just people won't, won't open the things at all. But there's probably more to be learned from the data driven techniques than BuzzFeed is applying than not. Right. So David, you want to you pick up on that with how you guys have a big contributor network. It, traditional media brands built off of a sensibility. A lot of time there was a command and control. A lot of data was not even used and stuff like this. How do you bring more of, or do you bring more of that um, you know, sensibility into it with having like one set point of view? Or do you think for your audience, a younger audience, that that's just, they don't even understand that? I mean, with them, it's really all about giving them different point of views. Um, so, you know, just sticking to one way. And I think that's where, you know, legacy media and traditional media really have a lot to learn about the new generation and how they're growing up. Uh, they want to see things differently. They don't want to see things the same way, you know, they would be seen on CNN or CNBC. Um, you know, they need to be given a reason to read the story. Um, and be given a reason to interact with the story um, because they'll give you a million reasons as to why they shouldn't because so, so what's an example of like a story that that you guys did in a way that particularly speaks to that generation? So I'll give you a good example um, with the whole Syria conflict. Uh, so what we really did is um, obviously a bunch of our contributors got involved and giving different point of views on what's going on and you know how the conflict can affect the rest of the world. Um, so uh, you know we had about 20 articles, 20 different articles about Syria, um, and you know we told, we set out and we told ourselves, all right, let's see what people interact with most. Uh, obviously this is a big problem. Obviously everybody's tweeting about it. 
but do they really know about it and how much are they really willing to go into deeper? Um, we found out of those 20 articles about the Syrian conflict, the one that did the best was titled, uh, Your Ultimate Cheat Sheet to the Syrian Conflict. So that was the article that everybody read. The reason was because it, it, the title obviously grabbed them with being short and concise and really giving them everything they needed to know without having to read a New York Times article and not knowing what 50 of the words in the article mean. So Scott, I, I, just to, to pick up on that, because I, I think you guys published a, a article that explained the Syria conflict with Jurassic Park gifts, right? Yes. Okay. Is that, um, was that a good article? Um, I think it was a pretty good article. I mean, I, th I think certainly if you if you came to it with no understanding of the background of, of what was happening in Syria and you wanted to understand the conflict, you would actually be able to get the you know you would you would come away with new information for you about the world. Um, it was definitely uh, you know something that, that people picked up on because of the 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 nature of using gifts from a, you know a movie from the 90s to explain uh, current atrocities is is a new form of storytelling. Um, I don't know if it was the best example of that that we've ever had for sure, but I would much rather that our editors experiment and fail uh, occasionally with things like that than be so afraid of trying new forms that they are, are never really able to, to innovate in any way. I mean, what do you think traditional media can pick up on from that? Because I think a lot of traditional media see that and they're like, they think that's pandering and that's, that's dumbing things down. Um, I, you know, I, I think that it's interesting even seeing people in traditional media be very afraid of using animated GIFs in an article, just kind of full stop. Like that, that notion is somehow laughable or, or beneath them. Is, to me, is really interesting. I mean, certainly um, with, when it comes to sports coverage, an animated GIF is an incredible way to isolate a moment in a game or in any sort of athletic event. You can loop it over and over and talk about very specifically about what's going on there. And that's a great way to, to do sports coverage. Um, so I, I think that... You know, there are many different forms of storytelling that are, that are coming out now on the web. Um, animated GIFs is just one of them. Uh, lists obviously are nothing new. They're just, they're an, another set, uh, n another piece of the, of the toolbox. Um, and I think that traditional media could certainly stand to feel a little more free to experiment with those. That doesn't mean they need to jump in immediately to making, you know, 33 animals who are disappointed in you. Um, but I think there are some things about um, ways of telling stories and ways of reaching an audience that is consuming media primarily on Facebook, on Tumblr, on Twitter um, in a slightly different way than we're used to. Yeah, D David Spitz, you, you had brought this subject up. What, what specifically do you think traditional media can learn from the success of these more viral media properties? Yeah, you said it wasn't a bag of tricks. I, I feel like it sort of is a bag of tricks. There's not one uh, silver bullet that uh, traditional media can learn. You know, it's not just the clicky headlines. It's, it's uh, a whole combination of things to, to just, you know, run off a few quickly. It would be a more democratic thinking about where the, the sources of content. So we powered Syria coverage for Al Jazeera and for uh, NBC News. NBC News was a hashtag conversation saying, hashtag, what side are you on taking sides? Uh, that was pretty bold for NBC News to open up their discussion of Syria to their to their audience. Uh, so a more democratic approach to where content comes from, a more democratic approach to where content lives and is produced first. Uh, also more mobile responsiveness. I mean, there's a lot of design thinking that goes into BuzzFeed that people don't pay a lot of attention to because, as you said, 75% of the uh, engagement comes from the Facebook front page, but once you get to the BuzzFeed page or, or a modern media property page, you're coming there. If you're coming from social media, you're probably coming from, on a mobile device. So, you know, uh, a better format, uh, wider image layout, more responsive design, all those things go together. It's not, it's not a single thing that I could, that I could point right. to. Yeah. David, you, you had mentioned uh, the, the Syria news and that that actually did quite well because sometimes I was listening to Nick Delosio uh, earlier and he was saying, you know, and he's 19 or 17, uh, and he was saying, actually, my generation is very interested in knowing what's going on. It's just not being packaged correctly. Is that what you guys are finding? Is that sort of the mission? Yeah, that's really the mission, and that's really why we set out to create Elite Daily. Um, we just saw a huge void in the marketplace. Um, traditional media wasn't really appealing to people our age. Um, and if you think, you know, we're doing something different, just wait, because five years from now, 
those younger guys, they're going to be changing everything we're talking about here. Um, so the world's going to constantly keep moving. Um, and, you know, our mission is always to stay, you know, make sure that we can understand uh, people from an age group of 18 to 35 and even worrying about those that are about to be 18. Um, because to be the ones that are able to package it correctly for them and give it to them in a way that they want to see it, maybe it's with Jurassic Park GIFs, maybe it's calling it a cheat sheet because that's what they understand is, you know, short and concise and to the point. Um, the other thing I have to say is, um, um, you know, with Rebel Mouse, uh, you, you're going to see you know, a huge influx of younger guys being able to create, um, you know, content websites because now the barrier to entry is a lot, you know, a, a lot smaller and it's a lot, a lot cheaper as well. You know, if Rebel Mouse was around when I started my website, you know, we would be six to nine months ahead uh, just because the platform would be already there for you. Um, does, that, does that worry you? That was a great, that was a, we were going to talk about native advertising later, but that was a perfect in, intro. Um, does that worry you, though? I mean, because the, the, the very thing that allowed you to go from zero to 40 million, yeah. there's someone else out there who's going to apply the next generation of tactics to do that. Yeah. And so how do you outrace that while building a brand that actually lasts? So, I mean, I'm sure, you know, that's both of our concerns here. Um, but the biggest thing is just really being one step ahead um, and always understanding what people want. Um, you know, if we have to have, uh, you know, 15-year-olds intern for us in the summer just to understand where the trend is going, um, you know, that's something that we're going to have to do. Um, it's really being one step ahead of the game. And, and in today's world, the world's moving extremely fast, especially in the tech space. Um, and, you know, the, the biggest, uh, you know, Obviously, that's a fear to us, but the biggest fear should come to traditional media because, you know, they're really taking a while to really pick up on what's going on here now. I mean, we saw about two months ago, we did a GIF list about Drake and his new album, um, and then ABC News did a GIF list about Drake and his new album probably two days after, and it was prob probably exactly the same thing that we did. Um, you know, so, again, it's something that they don't understand, and, uh, you know, they're looking at sites like Elite Daily, BuzzFeed, and all the other viral sites out there. Um, but they're really going to have to pick up their pace, and if anything, they should be a lot more worried than we. Um, because maybe in seven years, by the guys who are 18 year old, BuzzFeed and Lee Daly will be called old, but C guys like CNN will be called historic. Uh, so that's really, you know, the concern mostly falls on them. Obviously, it's on us as well to stay one step ahead of the game. But, you know, I think it's a, a playing field that we're all pretty well aware of. Yeah, I mean, Scott, I mean, it's amazing to think BuzzFeed has actually been around eight years. Um, yeah, I mean, people are constantly surprised to hear but, that. But, you, you, but, uh, I mean, it took a couple of years to really figure it out, right? So we've seen since then sites like Upworthy and even Viral Novo, it's one person built yeah. like a, an enormous um, audience. I mean, how concerned does that make you that the very things that allowed you guys to grow very quickly can be mastered by other people? Um, I mean, I think we're, we're taking that more as a sign that this is a very uh, robust marketplace and also that there's a, real, there's a real appetite out there for this type of content. I think it kind of speaks to the, the hole in, in traditional media that, that David was talking about. Um, and we also don't see it as a zero-sum game. The, the web is vast. There is a lot of room for, I think, a lot of players. Um, at BuzzFeed, we have definitely, over the last you know, three years, you know, one of the ways I think we've differentiated ourselves is we're, ex you know, we're expanding in journalism. We're hiring journalists at a pretty high rate. Uh, we have foreign correspondents now. We've just launched an investigative unit. Um, so we're trying to find other ways definitely to differentiate ourselves so that our, you know, our entire business isn't built just on the fact that we have a, a very large site if, if traffic is going to be the only grounds that we're, we're competing against others on. Um, so that, I think that, that's, that's a good move, but I, I do think it really speaks well that that's a thing that's happening, that the internet allows this kind of content to grow very, very rapidly is, is good for, for all of us who are making it there. Yeah. So you were editor of BuzzFeed, really, when it, when it began as mostly aggregation, a lot of cats. Yes. Um, and then, you know, Ben came in and brought in a lot more of uh, original journalism. How does that not become incoherent? Or is that just something that's not as much of a concern in a world of Facebook feeds where you're used to seeing photos of your family, stories from the New York Times? Yeah, I think that's exactly it. We kind of wanted to reflect the experience of most of the people who read BuzzFeed, which is that they're not typing in NewYorkTimes.com and going to a front page and clicking on the biggest headline. They're experiencing news in their feed. So it's either on Twitter or on Facebook or, or in whatever way they like to experience the web. And when you consume media online, yeah, you have pictures of your friends' children right next to stories about the government debt. And I don't, we didn't feel like there was any real inconsistency in, in building a news organization in the same way. 
David, do you see that? I mean, uh, earlier there was some talk about the blurring of entertainment and news. Um, not as much of a concern, really. You just think that's the way things are going? Um, I, you know, I think you have to package everything nowadays. Uh, you're dealing with an audience that has ADD and sits on Facebook and procrastinates a lot. Um, you know, you really have to give them everything in one place because to depend on them to go to five different URLs, um, one that's covering just business, one that's covering just entertainment, and one that's just covering just news is not going to happen in today's world. Uh, they're too spoiled. Um, you know, we even had to get rid of slideshows thanks to BuzzFeed because uh, you know we everybody was too spoiled to actually click through them. Uh, they just wanted to scroll right through them. Um, so you know, in today's world, you're dealing with a very very spoiled audience uh, that grew up on social media, not in the search era. Um, and you know they, they want to see everything all together. They don't want niche. They don't want to see niche sites. They really rather see everything in one place and be able to get all their information from one hub. And also depend on their friends to feed them information through Facebook. You know and that's why they share articles with each other and that's why they engage with each other through articles. David, do you want to react to that? Because before Rebel Mouse, you were at WPP. Um, what do you think these guys should be most concerned about with their businesses? Um, <clears throat> well. It strikes me that right now it's like the early days of cable where uh, the pipes were there but the content wasn't there. So if you just showed up with some halfway decent content, not saying that your content's halfway decent, but if you just showed up, you'd attract an enormous audience and tons of, um, of ad dollars. And it's not such a big deal whether your content is niche enough. Uh, you know, th those are minor concerns or if there are low barriers to entry, those are minor concerns in the early days. Uh, but as things evolve, there was certainly a fragmentation of the cable channels into more niche networks. CNN, which was more generalized, and I'm sorry to use American examples, uh, became, uh, was losing market share to Fox, which was more, you know, had a more of a focus strategy. Uh, and so when you think about monetization, uh, that'll certainly come into play. I'd say that would be one concern is are we delivering, um, are we specific enough for the brand requirements and we're not just, you know, the reach guys who help you get onto social. Um, I guess the second thing from a marketer perspective would be, do I, do I need you to be a publisher? Do I need to associate with a publisher? So BuzzFeed in some ways is the WPP of the future, right? They're producing content, they're uh, aggregating audience, they're coming up with creative ideas, uh, but will the marketing agencies react by saying, we're gonna be the BuzzFeed of the future? We're gonna produce content ourselves, and rather than Virgin or GE placing that content, onto a publishing partner first, will they be producing it first in their own domains and then distributing it outward? I think those are the two things I would be thinking yeah, that's, about. That's a good segue into this, this um, topic of native advertising or sponsored content or whatever label you want to uh, put on it. I, BuzzFeed doesn't run display ads. You guys are no. all, all about sponsored content. Yeah. Um, is that a reflection of just a reality of, of being a, a socially, social as your DNA? Yeah, I mean, the, part of the reason that we decided to develop that as our as our strategy, our advertising strategy, is that we wanted to make we wanted the opportunity to make good ads. So BuzzFeed has essentially a creative agency inside the company. The people who make ads for BuzzFeed are not on the editorial side. It's a totally different department, but they do consume and read the web in a very similar way. And you know, we tried at some point very very early in in BuzzFeed's history, we tried. Uh, Google AdWords, and it was just totally, you know, no one clicked. It was totally ineffective. Um, we were never interested in doing banner ads because they're, you know, I don't think the consumers like them. I don't like them. I never click on them. I don't know people that do. The click-through rates are incredibly low, and mostly the kind of media that they show you is, it can often be really irritating. It's just flashing and annoying, and it's it's not a good experience for anyone involved. So we really wanted to think about a new way to, to do advertising, and that very naturally led to thinking about making content for brands. Um, so, David, is this the path? You, you guys have display advertising. Obviously, you're, you're really just starting on the monetization side. But how do you see the model evolving in a way that will appeal to this younger ADD generation? So, um, the biggest thing, I mean, just going off of what Scott said, uh, display ads are horrible. Everybody knows it. Click-through rates are extremely low. I mean, I don't know anybody that clicks on them. I don't think I've ever clicked on a display ad. Um, video pre-roll is even worse. I mean, anybody who has a video pre-roll coming up, they just usually go to a different window and come back once the video is ready for them. Um, so, you know, with online advertising, I mean, currently it's been extremely ineffective. And there's those traditional guys that will give you all the data they want, you know, tell you the CTRs are great and you're getting this and that. But the future is really uh, connecting the brand with the user and allowing the brand to tell a story with content. Um, but then that also goes into the conversation that, uh, 
what I do believe is that not all sites will be able to do sponsored content um, just because you can't have a political site and do sponsored content for a car company because then it's like, hey, this isn't really native. Um, you know, so to do native advertising, it has to really fit in with the content, um, and it also has to benefit the brand. Uh, that's the next thing about native. Uh, you know, it's it, obviously it's a new thing right now, and it's still evolving. Uh, but it's really understanding, doing the correct content, engaging the brand, engaging the user, storytelling, and actually get, having the brand get something out of it, rather than just saying, "Oh yeah, we have great, cool sponsor content." Um, so I think I think that's really the next step of figuring out sponsor content um, and really understanding how the brand will get more out of it than just saying we have cool sponsor content. So Scott, there's some controversy around the native advertising because um, on the one hand, it's it's meant to look like editorial content. It's that's what makes it native, right? Um, but then on the other hand, people say, well, it needs to be labeled properly. Is this a, a debate that you think is just sort of? I don't know, elite talking heads or it's not really an issue with consumers? Um, I, I don't know that it's a big issue with consumers. I think it is a little bit overblown um, in the media. It's certainly something that we're very concerned about, though. We would not want our readers to be confused about what it is that they're clicking on. Uh, when we very first started running uh, sponsored content on BuzzFeed, this was a thing we were worried about, that we were going to get a lot of comments because you can comment on ads on BuzzFeed, which is like not a thing that exists in other formats. And we were expecting that our users would be really upset and push back a lot, and they weren't. And part of the reason was, you know, I think the ads were pretty good. Um, but it's certainly not in our long-term interests, um, nor the long-term interests of any of the brands that we work with, for people to be confused about whether or not they're seeing an ad. And I also think that typically the media doesn't give uh, readers enough credit. They understand that when something says, you know, sponsored, featured, partner, and it's brought to you by Pepsi, that that's an ad. That's a thing you see very regularly in, in, in your Twitter feed, on Facebook. It's, it's, a, it's certainly a, a mode by which I think consumers and certainly readers of BuzzFeed are used to seeing advertising. How about from a millennial perspective? Do you think this is just not really an issue that, you know, ads don't have to be labeled as ads, they can be labeled as featured partner? Um, so the funny thing about millennials is you can get them very pissed off very, very fast. Uh, they have a very short fuse. So um, if they feel like, uh, you know, you've duped them in any way and you've sent them to a brand page and they weren't told so before and, you know, they, they will get very pissed and they will let you know very, very quickly. Um, whether it's sending an email or commenting. Um, so with us, it's always you know, being fully transparent with the readers and saying, hey, this is sponsored content, um, you know, rather than duping them in there. Um, so I do believe it is important to label it properly. Okay, I want to open it up to questions, but first I promised these guys that I would uh, do some word association with them. I uh, didn't really prepare them for it, but the idea is I'm just going to give you a term, uh, it'll be two each, and then you have to do a, a sort of tweet-sized response. So more than a word, less than like... A paragraph. Okay. You ready? Do you want first, Scott? Sure. Okay. Big data. Uh, Medium-sized data. Perfect. You're good at this. Okay, David. Um, uh, first, David. Yeah. Um, Click-through rate. Um, incredibly tiny on pre-roll and display advertising, and that's why it's a joke. Okay. Uh, it might have been more than 140 characters. <laughs> Uh, okay, the other David. Um, slideshows. Listicles. Okay. Scott, clickbait. Um, shareable headlines. <laughs> okay. Um, David, how about brands as publishers? Something that nobody wants to see. <laughs> okay. And the, the future. And the, <laughs> and the they final think, What one, they think is the future, but not really. <laughs> yeah. And the final one, uh, David. Uh, other David. Uh, privacy. Important. Top, one of the top three concerns for next year. Yeah. You're going to say dead. Uh, we still have a couple minutes. I wanted to open it up to, uh, to questions. I think there's a, a microphone here. Hi. Oh, yes. I'm Lucas Gani. I'm a publisher across Europe and Brazil online only. And uh, what you are doing is great. It's uh, absolute innovation. Traditional players uh, are copying you now on, on distribution. But the problem of Facebook uh, changing the, the really how they want uh, the, to show the content, uh, it's a big, big uh, issue for you. So what is the, your talks with Facebook on that, what uh, the indication they're giving to you? Because for sure you have a direct uh, relationship with them. Uh, yeah, I mean, what I, what I can say about that is that Facebook is very interested in figuring out 
new ways to keep people on Facebook. Um, you know, people are very used to seeing pictures of their friends, seeing status updates of what someone had for dinner that night, you know, whatever it is that people are, are sharing on Facebook. And Facebook's very, very interested in, in having people consume media on Facebook as well. So, you know, I think in a lot of ways, our, our interests and I think the interests of a lot of publishers are aligned. They want high quality content. Um, as a publisher, you want to create high quality content. You want it to perform well on Facebook. They want it to perform well on Facebook because if it's something that people like, they want to show it to more people in your social stream. So I, you know, I, I, th I think that um, while we're certainly always concerned that there's going to be some massive change to one of the platforms that we, that we look to for traffic that's going to hurt us, um, at the same time, I think there are increasingly ways in which the interest of publishers and, and uh, big platforms like Facebook Facebook are aligned. I think this is kind of the the cable model that that we were talking about earlier. Yeah, it's not. And it's not. Look at what's happened with cable. Twenty years later, it's still an issue. You know, every time something comes up for renewal, it's a big debate. It's not going to go away. There's going to be this cat and mouse for the next twenty years between publishers and the distribution partners like Facebook. And the only way around that is well to be a good negotiator but also to build a brand so that people demand I want my MTV I want my BuzzFeed I want my Elite Daily uh, so that they can't just completely shut you off. But Scott do you think you'll have to pay? I, I mean who knows I can't imagine that world but it also doesn't seem like it's that that's an impossibility at some point I mean or they'll pay us I mean who knows how that's going to ultimately shake out. Um, I think this one over here. Yes, thank you. This is for David from Elite Daily. I feel like your generation gets a bad rap, and no offense to Brian, but calling them the ADD generation is a little rough. <laughs> I think it. one of the really interesting things <laughs> that you said today was, my generation isn't not interested in information, it's just not being packaged correctly. I'm really interested in that. Without giving away the store, I'd just be curious to hear more from you about how my generation, I'm 46, could more effectively communicate with your generation on all fronts, not just on you know, internet platforms, but what is it that you guys are looking for in terms of gathering the information? Yeah. So my best advice to you is uh, to take every rule in the book and throw it out and be as open-minded as possible. Uh, the biggest issue with traditional media and older generations is that they're very stuck in one way of thinking and anything outside of that is considered wrong. But the issue is that it's perspective. Um, and once you understand that people my age have a different perspective on things you know, that we see and everybody else in a different age group might see, um, and once you really sit down and listen to what we want to see, that is when you can say, all right, then this is exactly what we have to do. Uh, so the best advice is to keep an open mind and just start on a clean slate. Uh, when we started this, I had no media background, no journalism background, and no technology background. It was just, hey, I'm sick of everything I'm seeing online. I want to create something that people my age can read, and there's got to be somebody as crazy as me. Even if I have two readers, then there's two people as crazy as me. But we did that you know, with no rule book or anything of that nature. I don't want you to give up you know, the secrets, but yeah. more specifically, you said that you wanted something concise. Yeah. And I think, is that really the, your generation's hardest thing? It's, the, it's not the ADD thing in the negative sense, it's just that you have a way of synthesizing information more rapidly than maybe my generation can. So while we, we think that you're just being flip about it, you're actually absorbing it faster than we are, so you're ready to move on before we are. So the thing about our era is that we grew up on quick time. You know, we get mad when our video player doesn't ro load too fast. We grew up hearing, you know, radio stations give you the 60 second update of what's happening. Um, you know, you guys grew up where you would have to watch an hour news segment and that's when you got all your information. You know, we were used to, all right, if we need a study and we have one hour, we'll cram everything in one hour. And that's pretty possible. Um, you know, th so that's really where the differentiation of the thinking is. Um, it's just different times of growing up and expecting things to happen faster. You know, if I'm reading a 3,000 word article, I'm probably going to skip to the end just to find out what happens. Um, you know, so you have to take that thinking and say, okay, I have to make this article 700 words because then somebody will actually go through the whole thing. Okay, I think one last one. Saying that you have to skip through to a 700 word article is not necessarily a good thing. Um, there's such a loss of nuance and a loss of appropriate context in storytelling right now that a good portion of what's going on in the world would be better served for better detail. So I'm not passing judgment on you guys at all, but it's like, but maybe I am actually. Um, I, yeah, okay. I am, okay, big time. I am passing judgment because so things need to be understood to be solved and changed. 
I mean, just to kind of go back to what you just said, um, it goes back to keeping an open mind, and I understand the solving and being changed. Uh, the funny thing that we actually found is sometimes readers don't even read the article and just tweet the headline um, just to get it out there. Um, so, you know, if you're really expecting them to dive, dive deeper, they're not going to. Um, Can I also jump in? I mean, we, we have, you know, recently been doing a lot more long-form journalism on the site, and we, uh, two weeks ago, ran a piece that was... Um, you know, well over 6,000 words. It was about a guy buying a house in Detroit for $500, and it has over a million views. So I think it shows that there actually is, there is a huge readership of, that wants long, detailed, um, and very thorough reporting and information. Um, I think they want it maybe in a slightly different package. You know, our first long form piece we ran, the artwork was animated GIFs, um, which just, you know, it seemed to fit. It was a long thing about Atari. Um, I think the, the trick is matching the, the topic to the appropriate form. I mean, Upworthy up was here earlier, so we didn't cover the, the potential of this type of content for change. Uh, the Dodo is a site that we launched last week, uh, which is all about the connection between people and animals. And it has a huge component of rallying the readership, using the social channels, the same tools that everyone here is using, to protect uh, animal rights. So, you know, depending on the topic area, it's not just entertainment, but it does ha also have a huge potential for change uh, that I think we, we maybe didn't cover, cover fully enough. And last thing... <laughs> and, and, and last thing, don't get me wrong. I mean, there is still people that are interested in longer form journalism, but the majority out there, I mean, from what we're seeing, just wants it a lot more clear and concise and shorter. Okay. Well, we're going to have to leave it at that. <laughs> David, David, and Scott, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.